sole task this evening is to introduce Sir Richard Wilson, Lord Wilson, ex cabinet secretary and recently retired as uh, Master of Emmanuel College, Cambridge, who's going to give us his reflections on Sicily, who will be new for quite a number of years. I had, I was walking along the Strand this week on Tuesday afternoon, uh, thinking actually about what I would say to you this evening, absorbed in my own thoughts, when I had a very unexpected experience, which was um, I found myself looking straight at Cicely Saunders. Uh, it was not, of course, the real person, alas. Uh, but King's College have got a life-size uh, photograph of Cicely standing uh, in the window looking at you as you walk along the street. And she caught my eye. Uh, she's beaming at the public in a very characteristic way. And for one lovely surreal moment before my super ego intervened and brought me back to my senses, I felt as though I just bumped into her. Uh, and I was so pleased to see her. I was absolutely delighted. Uh, just as I am pleased to have her encouragement this evening uh, as I talk to you, and if need be, I will look to her for guidance as I talk. But that, for me, is the first thing I want to say about Cicely Saunders, which is she was one of those people who makes your heart give a little skip when you, find, when you meet her, uh, because you're really pleased to see her, and you know it's going to be interesting and enjoyable talking to her. Uh, and I think that's the right starting point to tell her, tell you about her. I first met uh, her, Cicely Saunders, I can't remember whether it was 1990 or 1991, but it must have been, I'd have thought early 91. She had just written a letter to the Times, which those who knew Cicely will not be surprised about, because she appeared frequently in the columns of the newspapers. She was very, very good promoter of the hospice movement and her lines of thought. And the letter said, that the hospice movement, which was fragmented and pretty unregulated at that time, and she was worried that it was exposed to the risk of things going wrong, to scandal, because some fairly odd, she didn't put it like this, but some rather odd things are happening at the fringes under the title of hospices. And she said there needs to be a new umbrella organisation uh, which brings the hospice movement together and establishes uh, common standards, an authority which can lay down the rule and, 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 and regulate uh, the, the movement a bit. Um, and she was simply said in the letter, is, she made a direct appeal, is there anybody who knows how we set that up, who can help set up that umbrella body uh, and finance it? Uh, absolutely, you no. Know, I was working in the Treasury at the time uh, and a man called Geoffrey Tucker, who is a, a, a parliamentary lobbyist, but with a very strong, generous philanthropic streak, uh, rang me up in the Treasury and said uh, he wanted to take on Dame Cicely's challenge. Uh, would I help him? And I don't know why, but I said, yes, I would. He said he wanted to give a dinner with her to explore exactly what she had in mind, uh, uh, everyone was going to be sitting round a round table, so that no one would be, as it were, in a superior position. And would I help get the discussion going? Um, and I said, I'd done this with him in other contexts before, and I said immediately, yes. And I was ineluctably then drawn, particularly by Sicily, into the process of a complex, difficult operation, which ended up with the setting up of the National Council for Palliative Care, uh, which still exists. And it was funded initially by British Gas. Uh, and Geoffrey Tucker, I'd like to pay a tribute to him for what he achieved, but Sicily was absolutely at the heart of it, a kind of engine which, uh, which pulled us, drove us all along to making it happen. We had lots of dinners around the round table, uh, some of them attended by uh, uh, Irene Higginson, who doesn't look any different now. She looked a little more sort of scared then and, 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 uh, <laughs> and, and she does now, but she, she, she was looking, she, but she was terrific. Do you, I don't know if you remember those. You can, I do. Yeah, I yeah. remember the fear as well. Yes, yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> well she, she, she was, she was marvellous. Um, and the, um, 
the, the, those round tables are actually remembered in the table set up, in the, which we've been sitting around with ICEP this afternoon. That table, uh, was, uh, with the f money for that table, was raised by Geoffrey's widow, uh, and that table commemorates these dinners. So I, there's a small footnote there. And during the course of that process of setting up the, uh, the, the National Council of Palliative Care, I got, know, got to know Cicely Saunders, um, a, a huge, a, which is, I, I just feel grateful for. And I, all I can do is offer you uh, some snapshots. She was, I think, a, a sort of um, irresistible teacher uh, who um, could infect you with her enthusiasm. I recall early on in those dinners, I sat next to her and I remember her giving me a pretty detailed lecture about diamorphine, is that the right? And, 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 and stepping up doses to, uh, towards the end of life and, all, and going through all the other drugs which, which were involved with, and, and, and in her research. And I heard myself saying rather weakly, um, isn't there a danger that if you give someone doses of that size, they will get addicted? And she turned to me formidably and marvellously and said, I don't think if someone gets released from pain at the end of their life and it gives them the chance to come to terms with their own death uh, it, and, and with their loved ones, it really matters if they get addicted for a few days. Do you? And I, <laughs> it was just, I can't convey to you, but it was just the common sense of what she said, which I, which I loved. Um, I can also remember her talk, talking to her about um, the battles she had, in, particularly in the late 50s and with the medical establishment. And the, what I can most remember was the, I don't know whether the word is anger or indignation or something very powerful, when she said um, that patients had to earn their morphine by first experiencing pain. And she just was so outraged by, and she, I, I, it, it, I, can I commend you this book, Watch With Me, which is six uh, lectures that she gave over 30 years. It, it, I took that phrase out of the book because it is her own phrase. And you can feel the indignation as you, as you read them. Um, it is quite hard now to remember how novel it was, uh, to the, the approach that she was uh, uh, recommending to palliative care, and the hostility that she encountered from doctors. A woman challenging the received view of the medical establishment in medicine of all professions, it was really brave. I mean, no one who wasn't really driven and determined would take on that battle. And she, she did it with the lightest, the best spirit you can possibly ask for. Because I can remember going around St Christopher's Hospice with her and remarking to her, how surprised I was that, it was that it was so cheerful and that seemed so happy at some level. And she turned at me as if I was, you know, slowly getting it um, and said, of course, that's the point. Uh, and I like that. Um, equally, I was quite amused with the setting up of the, the palliative, uh, the National Council by how she, such a strong person was not at home with the kind of politics and intrigue which surrounded the uh, negotiations we had to bring everyone together. There was, I mean, it, it, what I learned at the time was that the hospice movement, I hope I don't offend anyone, but this is 20 years ago, the hospice movement, which did, did such marvelous work and such intrinsic good for so many people, had a kind of ne e a negative and equal and opposite effect in its own relationships with each other. Uh, the, 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 it was not a happy movement. There was a kind of uh, difficult relations which were very hard to manage. And we had a conference at a place near King's Cross. I can't think why or where it was, um, where we got everyone together with Sicily and we determined to make them, we could, they could not leave until they had signed up to the, to the, uh, to the National Council of Policy of Care. We sort of locked the doors and told them that this is the ambition of the meeting. There's lots of coffee and sandwiches, but we wanted their signatures. And actually, we got it in the end. But, um, and Geoffrey Tucker and myself were quite used to the world of, uh, of Westminster. It wasn't that different from an awful lot of politics. Um, but Sicily wasn't comfortable with any of it. Uh, she, she was terribly 
a bit good about it. We say to her, look, before we have this, we want you to go and talk to so-and-so, or you've got to be really nice to so-and-so now. And she would go and do it, but she was, it wasn't her world. She's, she was a, someone who knew what she believed in. She was determined to do it. She wasn't going to compromise on it. And being these sort of people who are wheeling and dealing and trying to get everyone into position so that we could get all the signatures and an, and an announcement at the end of the day, she wasn't comfortable with it, though she knew it was a good cause and she was prepared to go along with it. It was just a very interesting kind of insight that that was not where she was most at ease. I can remember so many conversations with her that I, want to, I can't, haven't got time. Um, I, when I got to know her better, I asked her rather cheekily how it was that Poland, or rather, to put it more bluntly, Polish men, had played such an important part in her life. Um, uh, and she took me through the, 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 the three key men, the three key men, all from Poland, David Tasma, a Jew from Warsaw, uh, who had had advanced cancer, uh, whom she had nursed in July 1947. I can't pronounce their names, because uh, Anthony, uh, an Eighth Army Polish refugee suffering from sarcoma, uh, whom she nursed in 1960, uh, and Marian, of course, a Polish artist whom she... Um, with whom she had a late but deeply happy marriage. And her response to this cheeky question was immediately open, fascinating, and complete. I wish to goodness I'd had a tape recorder because it was so, it was so honest. It was, and it told you so much about why she was such a great person. Um, I don't think you can understand Cicely Saunders or indeed the hospice movement without knowing about these relationships. And this book, she did talk about them, the three men, quite openly in, in, a, in a talk she gave uh, later in, in her life in Westminster Cathedral Hall in June 2003, if you want to know. But this, I'm going to read you out just a bit to give you a flavour of how she herself described her conversations with David Tasma. And these are her words. He was dying, he was an outpatient, she knew that he was lonely, so she went to see him quite often. And she was, at that point in 1947, developing her own thinking about palliative care. And she said, we talked around his life of only 40 years and his lost faith, together with his feeling that he had nothing for which the world would remember him. We discussed a home, capital H, which I might found to meet the needs of symptom control. This is 1948. An individual recognition at the end of life. He talked of his legacy. He left me 500 pounds saying, I will be a window in your home. Those are words that she quoted in ev on virtually every talk that she gave. And then on another evening, he suddenly said, can't you say something to comfort me? I suggested reading something from a book in my bag of Psalms and the New Testament. No, he said, I only want what is in your mind and in your heart. And those are words which, again, she repeats over and over in her, in her talks and in her writings. They were words for her that, the, that really w w were led her on. And um, they led on, her conversations with David led on to her momentous decision to read for medicine in 1951 and then to find St Christopher's and to do research which underpinned her venture into uh, palliative care and hospices. And the window funded by David did become a window in St. Christopher's. Uh, it also grew into £500,000, uh, because it, it sounds not much at the time, but it, it grew. What else about Cicely? She was hugely intelligent, my goodness. Um, and I like very much, I hope you will all take with you this lovely booklet that the Institute has produced. It's on the table outside. You cannot go, you're not allowed out without got, having a copy if they're... It's got lovely things in it. It's got all the events that we're having over the next year to celebrate this, or commemorate the centenary, sorry, of, of Cicely's um, death. But it's got in the front page uh, a, 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 a reference written for her by the um, principal of St Anne's Society in 1945, when Cicely must have been 27, saying, um, I think her rather varied experience should stand her in good stead in her professional life. She will certainly bring to it intelligence and determination. That lady had got, if you read the reference, she, uh, she had already read Cicely extremely well. Uh, and she says at one point, her intelligence is above the average. Well, come on. <laughs> she was enormously. 
I don't want to make her, I mean, I could talk about her for hours. I don't want to make her sound austere or dull or anything like that. The opposite was the case. By sheer coincidence, and I was just talking to her goddaughter, who's here tonight and is now hiding somewhere. Uh, there you are, she's over there. Um, I got to know someone called Isabel Ray, as she, in her maiden name, though I knew her as Isabel Lang. Um, and two or three years ago, I was talking to her, discovered that she had shared a flat together, I think, with your mother uh, in the early 50s. And I said to Isabel, what was Cicely like in those days? And Isabel said immediately, oh, she was fun. She was such fun. And that sounded, that's, I think, the thing to remember. I can remember 10 years, no, it must be more than 10 years ago, when Cicely was about to do a lecture and I was sitting with her, and it may have been before, uh, an, uh, during the day of an ISEP meeting, but I may have got that wrong. We were sitting there, and she was in her 80s, and I thought she's looking tired, and she's about to deliver a full lecture. So I said, well, it was only 4 o'clock in the afternoon, but I said to her, Cicely, you're looking tired, would you like a drink? And she said, clutched me, and she said, yes, make mine a double brandy. And I... I, 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 I I thought that was again sort of, I wasn't, I thought I might have been getting it wrong. Um, so what I want to say about her is uh, that I think um, it was a huge privilege knowing Cicely. I, I think she was an utterly extraordinary, lovely, marvellous person. And if there is a book going for people who are going to become saints, I want her to be in the running because I think actually she, she deserves that. But the, one of the last conversations I had with her were about, was about the institute, this institute, the CSI. And she said to me, I was trying to understand what it was for, and she said to me, now look, you're going to die, and whatever route you take to death, there will be, you will suffer from probably one of, say, six or seven symptoms and possibly more. And she listed them all. Uh, and she said, people associate me and St. Christopher's with cancer, but I want to move now into palliative care across lots of uh, ways in which people die. And I want the Institute to be the instrument for doing that. And it mattered to her hugely that the Institute should be set up and that it should be a success, as it is, thanks to the efforts of the trustees. I pay huge tribute to my colleagues and, above all, to Irene and her team. I think they are, it is just extraordinary uh, how well it's gone. Um, and I just want to say one, announce one thing that is that a, a marvellous piece of news that has just happened, which is that um, an award of 2.8 million has been made to us uh, by, recently, by the Atlantic Philanthropies to carry out a programme of work over three years, not only in the UK, but in the United States, Ireland, including Northern Ireland, and Vietnam. Our partners in this international collaboration are King's College London, Trinity College Dublin, Mount Sinai Medical Centre, the Northern Ireland Hospice, and Resources for Health Equity in Vietnam. All successful institutions in their own right, with the Sisterly Saunders Institute as the lead inst institution. The three components of this, and it's really tremendous news, this. The three components of this tremendous award will be, are as follows. They will improve the way in which chronic conditions are managed for millions of people by supporting the development of palliative care tools, resources and training programmes to identify problems earlier, assess patients' and families' needs and respond with more effective and cost-effective models of care. Um, they will improve global access for the growing, growing numbers of people in need of palliative care and embed it in international policy and practice by developing a global fellowship programme that supports international collaboration community building and leadership development. And finally, they will influence policy, yes, funding and practice and integrate palliative care into chronic care settings. A key focus for Atlantic philanthropies, to whom we're hugely grateful, has been to improve care for older people. And we've ensured that this important theme will run through all the strands of the work. Um, you will, of course, remember that Atlantic were key funders in setting up this institute, giving us £4 million. For this award, they specified that the amount of their donation should be matched by other funders, and again, they've asked us to do it this time. 
Cicely Saunders International and King's College London need to find a match for around a half of the 2.8 million as our partner and our partner institutions will secure their own matched funding. We did it last time and we are confident that we'll be able to repeat our success with some help from our friends and supporters. So I just want to say this is an exciting moment that CSI, it's always been an exciting institute. Um, it is marvellous that uh, Cicely Saunders is, as it were, still living in the way the Institute and all the work which people here are doing to carry it forward. Um, I think it is, she was a person of huge vision. Uh, I think we should uh, look forward to commemorating her in a worthy way and do get the booklet. Um, but as we commemorate her uh, and look forward to the future work of the Institute, I just want to offer my congratulations to the team here who secured the gift and who are doing such marvellous work. I think they deserve a really good round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs>